Chapter 7 of the Boy Scouts in Russia by John Blaine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kangaroo. A Daring Ruse. It would be hard to say which was more surprised, Fred or the soldier. For just a moment they stood, both of them perfectly still, staring at one another with fallen jaws and then Fred acted by pure instinct and without semblance of a plan in his mind. He had played football in school and on the team of his scout troop in America. And now he dived for the astonished German's legs and brought him down with a flying tackle. The heavy gun flew out of the soldier's hands, and fortunately for Fred, he fell so that his head struck the ground heavily. He was stunned, and for the moment at least, safe, and out of commission. There was time, therefore, for Fred to see how the ground lay. He found that he was in a slight hollow, sandy in the bottom, where he stood and the soldier lay. He imagined that at certain times this hollow might be filled with water, for the sand had that appearance, and moreover there was a gully evidently washed out by the water, leading down into a pit. Wonder how long he's good for, speculated Fred, looking at the soldier. A few minutes, anyhow, he got quite a bump. He satisfied himself in a moment that the soldier was not badly hurt. He was a ridiculous figure as he lay there sprawled out. His breathing was heavy. It sounded almost like a heavy snoring. He was very young, scarcely more than a boy himself. His uniform was entirely new, and his equipment. He was very slight, too, and his face was typical of a certain sort of German. He looked, Fred thought, like a bird. It was a queer idea, and he laughed as it came to him, but it did describe this German absolutely. I'll risk it, Fred decided. He hesitated about the door. Perhaps he ought to close it, but if he did, he couldn't open it again from this side for that was a secret he hadn't learned. And after all, the only danger was that the soldier might come to his senses and go in, and if he did that, Fred could follow him. So taking the rifle, he crawled along the gully, the rain had washed out, moving very cautiously as he neared the top. He lifted his head and saw, not more than fifty yards away, a gray stone house, simple and unassuming, a flagpole had been put up in front of the house, and a German flag drooped from it. Soldiers were all about the place, and two automobiles stood before the door. Motorcycles were lying on the ground. While Fred watched, two men rode up on the snorting, crackling little machines and hurried into the house. This was undoubtedly the parsonage, now being used as the headquarters of Colonel Goldapp. Fred's heart sank as he surveyed the place. It seemed to him that there wasn't much chance that he could rescue Boris. There were too many Germans about. Even though there was no reason for the staff to anticipate an attack, he could guess that the place would be well guarded. And yet, he was here because he hoped that he would be able, after seeing the parsonage, to devise some plan of getting Boris away. However, that was something to be attempted later, if at all. His chief concern now was for the soldier he had thrown. And now he made his way back and found to his dismay that the man was beginning to recover his senses. As Fred came back, he stretched, yawned, and sat up with the most ludicrous mixture of fright and wonder in his eyes. Fred had his gun, and at the sight of that, the soldier spoke indignantly. Give me back my gun, he said testily. It is against the rules for anyone to touch my gun. If you let the corporal catch you with that, there'll be trouble, I promise you. Fred had hard work to control his features. He wondered if the man was really a little simple-minded, or if the effects of his fall still confused him. He finally decided that both theories were right. For a moment he hesitated, wondering what to do. He wanted to get back into the passageway, and he did not want the German to see him doing it. 
as he thought, he studied the entrance attentively, and he was startled suddenly to find that he could not see it. Had something happened? Had the door closed automatically? If that were so, he was in a nice fix, and he would soon join Boris as a prisoner. But then he realized that the seeming disappearance of this opening was simply the result of a clever screening, by means of bushes. It had deceived him for a moment. He saw that the door was so contrived that anyone emerging from it would seem to anyone even a few feet away to be simply coming out from behind a bush. And then he got his great idea, an idea that made him turn his head so that the soldier would not see the grin he could not suppress. Here, give me that gun, said the soldier again. He was more impatient than before, and his tone was one of anger. He struggled his feet, too, and stood, swaying uncertainly, still weak and very dizzy as the result of his fall. Beware! The word came in a sepulchral, heavy voice from directly behind the soldier. He swung around, greatly puzzled. Who's there? he called sharply. I am everywhere said the same voice. But now it came from the very ground at his feet. And then the voice spoke, swinging around as the soldier turned, like a dancing dervish, trying always to face the voice, only to have it come from some new quarter. Attend carefully to what I say, said the mysterious voice. You have risked death by coming to this spot, but I am merciful and I wish to preserve all soldiers who fight for their fatherland. I am the spirit of this place. I command you to go. Go up the gully, stand with your back turned to this place, and count one hundred. Then, and only then, you may return. Your gun will be here, and you may then go in peace. This ground is sacred to me. On your life, when you have regained your gun, go. Do not look back. Do not hesitate. And above all, tell no one what you have seen. I have spoken. The soldier was trembling now in every limb. He looked hard at Fred, as if he suspected that he might have something to do with this mysterious, awesome voice. But Fred's lips never moved. Fred at home had often amused the guests of his family and the gatherings of his scout patrol, to which he belonged, with this trick of ventriloquism. But the Germany had evidently never heard of such a thing, and suddenly he broke into a run. He made for the gully and ran along it with stumbling feet. Now stop, boomed the voice directly in front of him. Not a step further, began to count aloud. Do but not shout. Ein, zwei, dry, vier, began the German obediently. And Fred, half choking with suppressed laughter, slipped behind the screened entrance of the secret passageway, while the soldier's back was still turned. He did not quite close the door, but waited to make sure the German's curiosity did not get the better of his fright, which had certainly been real enough. But it was all right. The man counted right up to a hundred, and once or twice, to Fred's huge amusement, when he stammered and lost count, of his numbers, he went back and counted several of them all over again. But he finished at last, and Fred heard him come stumbling down the gully. He seemed to hesitate then. May I really go now? he asked. I did not know there was a spirit here, or I would not have come. Yes, and go quickly, said Fred, throwing his voice out so it came from far above the soldier. He heard the soldier running then, and in a moment closed the door behind him and began retracing his steps along the secret tunnel. Gee, that was a close call, he said to himself. Serves me good and right, though, for doing more than I was told. I might have spoiled everything by not waiting until I knew more about this place. If that soldier hadn't been ready to see a ghost in anything, he didn't have some reason to expect to meet. I'd be in a lot of trouble now. And yet, I'll bet he's brave enough, too. If he had an enemy he could see and touch, he'd fight all right. 
but Fred had more to think about now than what had happened, or what might have happened either. He was more interested in what was to happen next. He went along, flashing his torch. There was no sound at the thin wall where he stopped, when he reached it, to listen for the sound of voices in the great hall. That encouraged him. He decided that if any soldiers had been left on guard in the place, they would have been in there. And when he came near to the panel by which he entered, when he let his torch wink out, he saw that there was light ahead of him. For a moment he caught his breath, wondering if some enemy had discovered the secret and was waiting to pounce on him. But he went on because he decided that anyone were waiting, they must already know that he was in the tunnel, and in a moment he came face to face with old Vladimir. The coast is clear, Excellency, said the old Russian. All the Germans have gone, a curse upon them. My master has told me to treat you as if you stood in his place until he returns. I have the things that Ivan brought. Is it your pleasure that I should deliver them to you? Fred was puzzled for a moment. Then he remembered the wireless. Oh, yes, by all means, he said. And show me the room where the wireless is. You know all about that, Vladimir. I know where it is. I do not understand such devil's work but I am an old man and stupid. Fred laughed. Perhaps it is devil's work, but if we have any luck, it will be pretty useful to us. Come on, if it's safe for me to come out. There's a lot of work for me to do. Vladimir led the way to the top of the house. On the roof, like a penthouse, there was a little room or cupola, and in this was a partially dismantled wireless installation. Fred was left there alone, while Vladimir went off to get the things that Ivan had given to him, for safekeeping, and he studied the installation closely. It was different from any that he had ever seen, but its leading principle, of course, was familiar to him. At first it surprised him to find that it was supplied with power by weak batteries, which the Germans had ruined. You couldn't send more than twenty miles with those batteries, he said to himself. But when Vladimir returned, that was explained, for he removed a picture that hung on the wall and disclosed a number of wires. I do not understand, he said, but my master and Ivan have told me that those wires that you see run down to a place far below the cellar, where there is a great engine that moves when petrol is in it. Oh, I see. A dynamo run by a diesel engine, probably, said Fred, suddenly enlightened. That's a fine idea. They can develop power without steam. Costs a lot, but it's worth it, of course. I'll just try that out. Quickly, he connected up the wires, tried out his key. After replacing the parts that had been taken away, and in a moment, got a powerful spark. That's great, he said to himself, ignoring old Vladimir, who watched him in fascinated wonder. I can send a long distance with that spark. Then he pounced on something he had overlooked before, a little book bound in black leather. As he opened it, he gave an exclamation of joy. It was a code book, and as he saw it once, and on the inside of the cover was a list of wireless stations with their calls. There was one at Verbalen, he saw, and a dozen other places just over the border, and running quite a distance into Russian territory, including one at Agiswodo, were named. Ivan told me to guard that book if it were my life, said Vladimir. He said to put it in a safe place, and to destroy it if the Germans found it, even if they killed me for doing it. He was right, said Fred soberly. If the Germans got that book, it would be as valuable to them as a whole army, Vladimir. It is very strange, said the old man. I do not understand, but I am old and stupid, and it is not for me to question my betters. Fred sat down and studied the code for a few moments. More than ever, he was glad 
now that his mother always insisted that he must be able to read and speak her Russian tongue. He would have to send in Morse instead of the somewhat simpler Continental Code, but that, he thought, would make little difference. Some operator would be certain to understand his sending. And now he sat down and began calling Sawalki. He would have liked to call Verbalin, which was nearer, but he was not sure that the Russians were still in possession of their station there, since he remembered that the Russians had had the superior force there on the Saturday night when the war broke out, a night that seemed to lie a century in the past now. For a long minute he hammered out his call, and then through the air, over miles of hostile country, came a welcome whisper in his ear, the whisper of the answering call from Suwaki. He was in touch with Russia. End of A Daring Ruse